So, we talked about these two equations. The first one is the action. Is the integral from T1 to T2 of the Lagrangian with respect to time. And what we mentioned is that Hamilton's principle states that the motion of a system from T1 to T2 um, with this integral as the action and the Lagrangian as the uh, kinetic minus the potential has a stationary, stationary value for the actual path of motion. <coughs> so the motion is such that the variation of this line integral is zero. And the variation we usually denote it uh, with a delta. So the variation of this action integral is gonna be the variation of, of that integral. Where the Lagrangian is going to be a function of the generalized constants um, and the generalized uh, coordinates. The time derivatives. Of the generalized coordinates and the time. All right, so we'll try to say a few uh, profound things about uh, this equation. What did we say last time? Well, there's this so-called uh, principle of least action. So we mentioned that this is in configurational space. So a whole system is going to be, you can represent it uh, as a point at some time. And So let's say that this is Q1, this is Q2, and this is Qn. And we have uh, many more axes, although it's difficult to draw them. The whole system and uh, I gave us an example, my water bottle um, is at this one point. And it's occupying that point at T1. Um, it doesn't need to move, but if it moves, let's say to um, another location in configurational space, uh, what is the condition for this line? that the variation is zero, right? So if that path integral, this one, is zero, um, can we say anything about the Lagrangian? The 
Mm -hmm. So one way to think about it is the system can drift to a different configuration as long as it doesn't require energy. Which makes sense. Um, energy seems to be pretty uh, well accounted for. Okay, so we're gonna look at some details about the calculus of variations today. Um, for this to be true, we assume that uh, virtual work, uh, well, we assume the principle of virtual work. And we mentioned that these equations are more general than Newton's laws. Can you think of an example in which this will hold? I guess the hint is that they always hold. Um, but it's not in agreement with Newton's second law. Well, one example will be um, special and general relativity. Um, Newton's second law doesn't describe that very well, uh, and yet they are uh, in here. So you can get a, a Lagrangian that is compatible with uh, general relativity and is the same, uh, the same principle. Also in quantum mechanics. How is the famous one um, called in quantum mechanics? Which will be the equivalent of this. Feynman came up with it. So here in our uh, virtual work, we can see there are paths that are just a little bit different than the original one. Um, uh, in quantum mechanics, I guess you have to consider each of them um, individually. And then you wait times the probability. Okay, so let's talk about variations. the door if that helps is the red one okay red. can you see it all yeah, right it's good thank you If the variation, um, in this case of i, the, the integral, but more generally of any function, um, if it's equal to zero, it means that um, i has a stationary value. Um, at a certain point where you're evaluating this. Um, what does it mean that the value is stationary? And I'm just going to draw it over here. For these, we're looking at a particular point. So let's say this one over here. 
it means that at these coordinates, so this will be q1, q2, qn, the rate of change of the function in every possible direction vanishes. So how will we uh, how do we define the rate of change in general of um, I guess any quantity? The time frame. Mm, here we don't have uh, time. Remember that we're looking at snapshots. Uh, everything is virtual. The time derivative uh, will be an instance of this. How do you calculate a delta in the lab, for example? Change in velocity or change in any quantity? Well, it will be the final velocity minus the initial, right? So you always have some final value minus the initial value. So here, um, we're going to have the value of the function um, at this particular point, um, one that is, let's call it f, at q um, plus some small displacement in q minus the original one. So we're looking at the neighborhood uh, of the point. So these ones are always uh, infinitesimally small. Uh, it says that, well, this function has to be zero. It vanishes in every possible direction. How many directions can we have? If this is configurational space. In principle, we could have a lot, right? So it has to vanish in every direction. If there's one in which it doesn't, then, well, it's not a stationary value. So notice that being having a stationary value doesn't mean that you are um, at a maximum or at a minimum. Why not? When you work with more regular functions, uh, you take the derivative, uh, you make it, you know, if it's equal to zero, then you know that it's a maximum or a minimum. How come that is not true here? Yeah, um, the second derivative will tell you whether it's a maximum or a minimum. So if you only have one derivative uh, that you're taking or one variable, then you know it has to be a maximum or a minimum. But here you can have values um, that increase or the second derivative uh, increases in some direction, decreases in some other direction. So that would be a, a saddle point. So you can have maximum, minima, or saddle point. Um, if you're looking at stability problems, for example, um, what is the stable position of a top or something like that, then uh, you have to minimize the potential energy. Uh, but in general, you can have, well, you're going to have potential energy, um, not at a minimum, and kinetic energy. 
And as long as the sum of those is constant, then um, they can be um, not a minimum. So this is a little bit more general. Okay, so now let's look at a function. F and it's going to be it's going to have several well, many variables u1 I mean u1 u2 all the way to un this function is continuous And differentiable. So we don't have anything weird in there. We can work with it um, in every variable. If this function has a stationary value, then the derivative um, of the function with respect to um, each of the variables is going to be what? Should be zero. Right. So when you do a regular um, optimization, or you're trying to uh, determine if it's an extremum um, in the function, then uh, you will have say this is a function of x and y, you're going to have the derivative with respect to x and then the derivative uh, with respect to y. And they occur at the same time, right? Uh, this is a two-dimensional space. Uh, for variations, uh, we can move um, in one direction only and look at the snapshots. So they don't have to be related to the other um, uh, variables necessarily. So again, this is uh, using the idea of a version work. So this work is, so this variation or this movement is virtual and infinitesimal. So you cannot really move away from the point. You have to be in the neighborhood. So in order to remind himself, I guess, um, and now remind everybody, uh, that we mean uh, virtual displacements, uh, Lagrange introduced the delta notation. So this one will be uh, delta x, delta y, rather than uh, the derivative that you will use normally. So the, the displacements are going to be delta u1, delta u2, all the way to delta UN. The change in the function is going to be delta F, so derivative of F 
which generates a function of all these u's. With respect to the first u, delta u1, dot, 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 Um, in order to deal with finite quantities rather than uh, infinitesimal quantities, we're going to make a substitution. So we're going to replace each of these deltas with epsilon and um, a. So this will be uh, epsilon a1 this one will be epsilon a2 and these um, a's I guess I can put it down here The A's are the components along, um, I guess the, the, the component in each direction of the virtual displacement that you're taking. So, this is the point that you're looking at, and this is the neighborhood. Well, I guess this is the neighborhood. And this can be high dimensional space. So we're going to have a path, and the path is going to, in general, have a component uh, in each A. So this is it's just um, vector calculus. Although remember that uh, these A's are not necessarily uh, orthogonal. And epsilon is just a small quantity. So we can <coughs> we can make it uh, 10 to 0. And so that this is how we get the delta. So if we make that substitution in here, this equation will now look like Um, I can put the epsilon on the other side, just multiplying everything, it's a constant. And this will be A1 A2 and A N. So if we want this to be equal to zero, which means what? That the variation is zero, right? We are imposing that. Um, if we want the variation to be zero, so for the function to have a stationary point, then um, the sum um, over all j's, I guess k I'm using here, So yes, this is all the, the terms, um, but the virtual displacement 
is arbitrary. So it can be in this direction, it can be in that other direction, it can be in that other direction. So very likely, if you have um, a sum in which the individual terms are not zero, and you know, for some lucky reason, it ends up being zero at the end. Uh, when you change the direction, that might still be a complete, totally valid virtual displacement, um, but the sum will not be zero. So in order to enforce that the first variation is zero, each individual term, this one, this one, this one, this one, has to be zero. And I guess we have seen similar cases um, a few times already in the class. So the condition for the first variation to be zero is that the derivative, I'm gonna put it over here, of the function with respect to UK It's zero for all k's. So this is pretty um, intuitive, right? You just want the derivative in every um, generalized coordinate to be zero. And then for sure you can be you, you will get um, uh, you'll get your uh, stationary point. So this is um, necessary, um, but it's also sufficient. Okay, so how do we I guess you already mentioned it. How we get the, uh, how do we decide if it's a maximum or a minimum? How do we do it? Taking the second derivative. And then what? And then testing. Mm -hmm. um, so if the second derivative is positive, um, what does that mean? minimum, right? Because everything else is going to be going kind of up. Okay, so uh, how do we implement the second variation um, for functions? to use the Taylor expansion or a Taylor expansion. Um, do you remember the definition of the Taylor expansion for um, multivariable functions? going to be equal to f of a, so in this case, this one, plus what? Well, it's going to be the first derivative. Um, 
points will be x minus a. So in this case, Um, this one, and then minus this one. So we get rid of the uj's, and uh, we end up with only that term. And then what's next? It's when things start to get interesting. So we're going to have j and k is the partial derivative of the function, um, I guess second, and then with respect to uj, and then with respect to uk. So in general, j and k can be the same index, but this is how the function changes when you are squeezing it into different directions at the same time. So, why the first step? No, the first step, like step four. This one? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking it's f prime of a to one n plus two n x summation f prime of a to one n plus two n x minus two. Um, well, I, I put it in this format because we're going to manipulate it in the future. Uh, but this uh, agrees with the Wikipedia definition. J, um, this is your, it could be a generalized coordinate. <coughs> But it could be x, y, and z, for example. So if you have x, y, and z, you will have j equals 1 is x, j equals 2 is y, and j equals 3 is z. And so here you will have the second derivative of the function with respect to x, um, and it could be with respect to y. Right? So you will have like all the, uh, all the combinations. So J is the index. Okay, and over here we're gonna have uh, two of these. Okay, and then this continues, right? So. About the one half over here. Over here is going to be one six, right? So one over three factorial. Um, oh, here okay, I'm going to have a one seven like that. Mm. Well, here I'm going to take it out. J k and l is going to be the third derivative and you're going to have with respect to the three uh, variables and more stuff so yeah we can calculate we can uh, get rid of these ones and so here we're just going to have the epsilon, two of them. So we can take it outside, it will be epsilon squared. And over here, we just need to leave the A. I guess both of them. Uh, this one's going to be cubed. And over here, we're going to have J, K, and L. 
here we can put the epsilon and aj. So this term over here, um, if we are um, at a stationary point, what is its value? This one. Zero, right? We just derive that. So because we are dealing with this case, we can forget about this term. And epsilon uh, is arbitrary, so we can make it small enough that um, we only need to go <coughs> to second order. So this one is going to be way too small, negligible uh, compared to this one. So we can forget about this one and all higher order terms. This one, uh, we can put it on the other side of the equation. So we can put it over here. And this is the function at some point that you're looking at minus uh, the value of the function at the original point. So this is just um, delta f. Um, I can put it over here. So this is the only term that we care about for the second variation. Well, this is the second variation. So usually the notation that you will see is you're going to see this as one half delta um, squared. So the second variation of f is going to be equal to delta f. So we have some tools now. We have a definition of the first variation and we have a definition of the second variation. So we can determine um, if a function has a stationary point and also if those points are an extremum. So if you want, if the second variation is positive, then um, for all values, uh, yeah, for all a's, um, then f is at a minimum. So just like in the case of uh, regular traditional calculus. And if it is negative for all values, then f is at a maximum. As I mentioned before, there's a third possibility, and that is that uh, the second variation is positive for some values of A and negative for the rest of the values. So in that case, uh, we're going to be at a saddle point. And uh, for your purposes of working with the Lagrangian and getting equations of motion and everything, it doesn't matter uh, if um, if it is a saddle point. The only thing that matters is that the first variation is zero. Okay, so 
in the equation that we had at the beginning, this function was uh, an integral. So we're going to, I guess, be applying differential calculus to the integral. Let's look at let's look at an example. It's called the how do I pronounce this? Brachistochrome. I don't remember how to pronounce that. Do you remember how to pronounce it? I'm going to write it down. So this part, of course, comes from time, from chronos. And uh, this other word, I guess, is also Greek. It means like same time or something like that. So this particular problem, uh, Johann Bernoulli came up with because he wanted to inspire people I don't know if inspire is the right word. Um, he wanted people to work on the uh, calculus of variations. It didn't quite exist at the time. It was like 16, 169 or something. Oh, 1696. It says, given two points, A and B, in a vertical plane, so this is two-dimensional, what is the curve traced out by a point Acted on only by gravity um, that's the end so what is this situation it's a plane in two dimensions it's vertical and you drop an object is your test particle and actually it was not yet <laughs> which starts at A and reaches B uh, in the shortest time So the, the trick here, or I guess something to notice, um, if you create um, this situation, so this is a gravitational field, you have uh, the ball over here, uh, you might go you know, down here and then up, if this is point B, this is point A. Um, and because it is accelerating the whole time that it is going down, uh, the velocity is going to be greater uh, over here too. So this is faster than, than this route. 
So he wanted to know exactly what is uh, this curve. The velocity is um, the SDT. So the S is VDT. And we want the integral from A to B of dt mm, over b. This is going to be the time taken between a and b. That is the integral from a to b of ds over b. The velocity, we can get it from conservation of mechanical energy. So one half of mv squared is mgy. We get rid of the masses and the velocity is twice gy square root. And ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. So this is just Pythagorean theorem. Um, we can rearrange it so that we get a dx squared times one plus dy dx squared. And we're going to define the derivative of y with respect to x as y dot. So this is going to be y dot squared and I guess we can take square root, square root, square root, and um, it's gonna be one plus y dot um, squared, square root of that, and then the velocity is square root of 2gy and square root of dx squared is just dx. So we can rewrite the, um, the integral in terms of dx, uh, y, and y dot. So if we want to find the shortest time, what do we do? Minimize the function. Yeah, so just minimize this integral. It is an integral. So, and we have to use the first variation. So uh, we can rewrite this integral more uh, abstractly as
So notice that y, y dot, and x come from the particular uh, integral that we're dealing with. Uh, but these kind of integrals, we, this relationship between the variables, um, they're pretty common. Uh, and in fact, we can eventually derive uh, Lagrange's equation uh, with only this. Uh, but for the time being, what we're going to do is we're going to use the definition, the sum definition of the integral. What is the, the definition? Is this calculus one? Hmm? Definition of what? Of integral as a sum. Um, let's do a drawing. Let's say that our function looks like that. Well, let's complete it. Um, between points A and B. And this is one dimensional. We can divide the range between uh, points A and B in as many uh, equally spaced coordinates uh, as we want. So, you know, if you're, um, if the distance here is kind of big, then um, th the sum is going to have a kind of a large error, but as the size of these bars goes to zero, your um, approximation is better and better, and it's uh, exact in the limit in which this delta x goes to zero. So if we want to be a little bit more formal, we're going to have a, a value x zero, which equals equals a. We are it has to be located at that value. X one, x two. xn, xn plus one. So you're going to need one more in order to specify uh, the last value. So this one is equal to b. What about uh, for the y values? Um, this value over here is going to be alpha, and this value over here is going to be beta. So those two values are also going to be likely specified by your problem. So why not is alpha? Why one? Uh, y2, yn, yn plus 1 equals uh, beta. And so each of these uh, x's is going to be associated with one of these y's. The derivative. Um, So we have a variable that is y dot, so the y dx. Um, to approximate it, instead of the y dx, we're going to have delta y delta x. So what will this be? The 
assumption or for like the difference between the two terms? Right? So y um, can do n plus 1 minus y n. And the same here, right? So notice that uh, this range is actually the same for each of these bars, um, although the values of the function are going to be different. So um, actually, I'm going to call it k. And I'm going to define this as z k. So then we can write the integral. Let's call it s for sum as the sum over all k of f uh, y yk zk. So I'm replacing, uh, approximating this one with this one. And xk. And this difference, which is the dx. So depending on how small, um, or I guess how many n's you have, or how many k's, uh, the, the value of s is going to approach the correct value of the integral. So now we can uh, apply some calculus of variations to, to these functions. To make things um, easier to compute, uh, we're going to um, change this k and call it um, k plus 1. <clears throat> um, and to not get confused, we're going to use j. Okay, so if we want to optimize this, what do we do? I guess you already said it. Um, the variation should be zero. So let's take, uh, where can I write this? Mm. Let uk, so some variable, be yk plus 1, which is going to be um, one of these values, the values in y. So it's a single point. The partial derivative of our sum with respect to yk plus 1 is the partial derivative with respect to y, so just the, the functional form, evaluated at x equals um, xk. So you are here, and you evaluate uh, this derivative at 
this point. And you're going to have the delta, so x k plus 1 minus x k. Uh, that is for the part that depends on y. And then you're going to have another one. Actually, you're going to have two uh, that depend on, um, on z. You're going to have the value um, k equals 1. And then in the following uh, term, in, in the sum, you're going to have the k plus 1. But both are with respect to this particular y dot. So we put both of them here. And when we take the derivative of this one, um, one of them, this is going to be non-zero. And then we're going to have the denominator, which is just multiplying. So and then the delta. So in this case, you can um, cancel them out. So this one, um, oh, the next one has a negative because this one has a positive, but this one has a negative. So it's negative um, partial derivative of f with respect to y dot at x equals x k plus one. And you again have these two terms that cancel each other out. Actually, I'm just going to remove it. So this happens um, at each point in your line. So if we put everything together, we put it here. put a negative in here, and it will be delta f delta y x k plus 1 um, minus equals xk and so just like we have uh, our definition of delta x which is this uh, if you look at the indices over here this is what no it's delta um, this quantity so we can replace it in there.
this is equal to zero. So I can divide these two terms by uh, delta x and delta x. Over here, it cancels this one. And over here, we have the delta x down here. So uh, I can rewrite it over here. What does that look like? Have we seen that equation before? The Lagrange equation. So if we take the limit uh, the limit of this as delta x goes to zero so this is a better and better um, approximation of your integral In that limit, this delta becomes um, just a derivative. So it's going to be the partial derivative of f with respect to y minus the derivative with respect to x of the partial derivative of f with respect to y dot. And this is uh, the Lagrange equation. So what did we do? We look at a problem in which we had to optimize uh, the value of an integral. In order to do that, instead of continuing with the analytical form, we move to this approximation and then we apply the rules of uh, variational calculus that we had just derived um, in order to get the function um, in, inside of the integral that optimizes um, that quantity. And it ended up being something that looks uh, suspiciously similar to the Lagrange equations. Um, are they, is this one the Lagrange equation though? Or are there any differences? Instead of x, we should have this x. Yep. And the y in general is correct. Um, so if we want to go from um, If we look at the first equation that we had, um, we had the integral of the Lagrangian as a function of q1, q2, qn, q dot, 1, q dot, two, and time. 
Um, notice that we can uh, group them. So we can have Q1, Q.1, um, when we take the derivatives, um, especially, and time. And then we're gonna have Q2, Q.2, and time, uh, and so on. So the variables that we were using over here you know, were spatial rather than time. It's because we we're trying to solve a time problem. Uh, but if you look at the relationships uh, between them, they are the same. So we have a coordinate, uh, it's derivative. So over here was dy dx. Um, but if we replace x with the time, then we will recover uh, all of this. So if you have the most general uh, Lagrangian, uh, you can still partition it uh, in these functions. And so um, that's why this is um, uh, a Lagrange's equation. This is an Euler-Lagrange equation. And this approach, taking the, the, the numerical sum, was by, uh, by Euler. Um, all right, so that's what I have for you today. Questions or anything else? No? Okay, let's go.